La Lanterna, a spotlight in Italian football, is a podcast that dives into the beautiful game seen from the eyes of two fans from the oldest team in Italy's point of view. My name is Fabrizio Cardone, Canadian and Genovese, together with my friend Matt Killen, an American-born and Genoa fan. Every week, we'll tell you all you need to know about the only team you need to know about, Genoa CFC. Plus, we'll have guests and provide updates from around the magical world of Italian football. Benvenuti, welcome to La Lanterna podcast. This is Fabrizio from Toronto with my best buddy, Matt, coming in live from New York. How are you, Fabri? What's going on? I'm really happy, I suppose. Yes. Super happy. And I'm already going to vote this season to be a success. I don't know how you can say anything else. I know that, like, we'll always have our gripes. You've watched me slowly become more and more accustomed to the Mugunio over time. Darn. Like, taking on my jaded Genoa fandom. I'm excited about that, I guess. But you've got to look at these things as, like, come on, man. Like, when was the last time? Like, obviously, last season with Serie B was a different thing. And that was special its own way because we've not had that experience in a really long time. I've never had that as a Genoa fan. You haven't in, in many, many years. And I, it sounds kind of shitty to look at Serie B as like, oh, that was a good experience. But honestly, there are lots of reasons why it was. But we remember the several campaigns before that where we were fighting for our lives almost every season, save for like a the odd season or two where we, you know, ended up mid table. And this is, this is all post Milito era, of course, all that stuff. So, and I think like you look at a season like this and what is there really to complain about? Like, what are we really going to be upset about with all the things that have happened, the way our club is being financed with how we're doing everything, our results, I don't know. I think they have to be excited right now as a Genoa fan. This is a good season. We're not always going to have good seasons. We should enjoy it. Next season might not be like this, you know? We have the exact same team and it might not be like this next season. I was looking at maybe since 2016-17, yeah. maybe 17-18, we finished at 12th. So it's nor here nor there. But everything after that, 17th the year after. Mm -hmm. So that's just bottom again. 2019-20 at the 17th. 17th spot again, 20th, 21, 11th. So it was like, oh, wow. Oh, that's not too bad. But I remember it that we were like at the tail bottom. I think it was with Ballardini that came and magically yep. brought us up. So that 11th is very fake. Yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was a crazy end to the season. I, I still felt... In fact, what happened the year after was relegation. Well, oh, okay, but this is history. I think we're doing amazing. Last year, Monza was the surprise of Serie A. I think Bologna is not the surprise anymore. It was a built-up that was happening within the last two, three years. Monza last year, at the same amount of, of uh, match days as we are today, match day 26, they were sitting at 33 points as we are today. So we are the surprise of Serie A. I was hoping for it, and I think we have shown to be that tough cookie, that tough team with an emerging coach in Serie A that everybody's looking to and complimenting. I mean, you have to. Yeah, at this point, you have to give us respect. That's the thing that like we're demanding the most. And it's part of why I think it it's encouraging. But let's talk more about the match. So obviously, we're reacting. We had um, a match week with Udinese. We're, we're welcoming them to the Ferraris. It's a game we talked about a little bit. Kind of a weird one. You know, this isn't a, a great year for fans in Udinese. But they're a team that always has some capable players. They're not without their skill set of players and things like that. They're obviously a team for several, several seasons are really, a, a staple in the top flight of Italian football. And so even on a down season, you kind of imagine, well, yes, the, the direction of how this club is going maybe is not wonderful, but there's still a club that have resources and whatever it might be, players that can maybe get a result. Obviously, you know, it ended the right way for us, 2-0. I think it was clearly a, a Genoa victory. We were very dominant in the match. We had some amazing chances. Didn't I say 2 nothing? You did. I think you did. I think you called it. I think I was more pessimistic ahead of this one. It was just wonderful because you saw all this activity, obviously a fantastic goal from Rotegi, which we'll talk about. You know, I was I was being a little harsh on Vasquez for what I still thought was a bit of a, a lapse from his perspective in the match before, which also is a symptom of defending, defending, defending in the match like we were doing. He almost had two different goals early on in the first half. He had some amazing between Goodmanson, either almost setting up a goal on those scoring goals. I mean, really, this match probably should have been 4-0. And so in, in this way, again, like 
you want to say whatever you want to say about opponents and whatever. And obviously they go down to 10 men at, at the beginning of the second half. But like all of those things, I don't care. This is a really important three points for us. It's a dominant, we deserve to be here type of a win. And I think you can only, you only move forward with things like this when they happen, I think. What stood out to you? Well, the match, of course, I'm, I can't really add much to what you said, but you're right. With respect to the fact that we got, got we came into the match, I was a little bit afraid at the same time because you never know when a, a team is at the bottom what their reaction is, with their need and hunger for points are going to come out. And you know, we have seen some matches where we suffered a little bit, looking at also at the first leg. But at the same time, this was a total different Genoa from the first leg. Genoa Udinese compared to Udinese Genoa, where we ended up with like that angry, if you remember, tie right at the end, and we were winning two nothing, and then it ended up two two. But at the same time, the first ten minutes were obviously people started to get a little bit frustrated and getting a little bit nervous there. As I said before, they're hungry for points, right? But then with those two occasions from Vasquez that were very, very close. amazing. Goodmanson to deliver. Oh, it's a good ball and it's off the post. Vasquez timed the header well, but just couldn't creep it inside the left glove of Okoye. Amazing, yeah. very close to the goal as well. Then the second half was essentially just a, a maintenance of what we needed to keep. As I was opening it up to saying, two great chances by Vasquez. Unbelievable. Sorry if I may say this, you might not agree, but to me, Vasquez is my MVP of the match. MVP of the match. Well, I, I ended up choosing Rutegi only just because we only see so many wonderful goals like that all so often. And he almost had an assist as well for Goodmanson a bit later in the match. It's hard to say because I think a lot of guys had really good performances. If you look at some of the player rating sites, they like Bonnie because he got on the score sheet and, and, and did a good job. I think like all of our defense had great up moments there and sort of I think it's a little bit wrong to look at him as maybe the best player. Not that he had a great game, only because that goal was so much Goodmanson's pass, you know, really. But I mean, I, I like Vasquez as a selection. I think that there were just so many moments in this match where there were different players that kind of came in and shined. There was one chance from Badel that he just slightly maybe not miss hit but was like slightly off target if that one i think it actually was saved but if, if he if he had a little bit of a different kind of precision on that that might be the more memorable mat goal even after rutegi's goal swung in by martin on the volley what a stop from okoye to deny Badel. So like you have all these different kind of things happening and I always am encouraged. I like seeing Rutegi get fired up because I still feel like there's maybe a gear that he's not completely shown us this season, which is not like, I don't mean that in a critical way of him, but when those types of goals go in, it makes you really looking in anticipation for matches like we have coming up against Inter where you've got you know, hopefully guys who are in confidence and then you're going into a really big challenging arena in a, a time where the spotlight's going to be on us. I mean, with us playing on Monday, looking again, looking to the next match, we're going to be the show that day. You know, it's a weeknight, but still. And I, I, I think, I don't, look, I don't know any, obviously, I don't know any of these guys personally. I don't know what's going on in their, their heads, but I feel like our guys would want to be up for these types of matches. Going back to what you were saying before, I, I totally agree that it is more, I guess the MVP could mostly also go to the team. I'm not that person that likes to give an MVP just because yeah, someone has right. scored, yeah. because it's not fair really to the team effort that led to the player to the scores. Now, obviously, if a player did three goals, amazing, one better than the other one, you could definitely give it that, that but Bonnie did an amazing match. Badel, I still don't understand those people that are against him. Um, yeah, but, right. uh, and, and everyone did really Really an amazing, even De Winter, I think he built up a little bit of a better match compared to the last few ones. You know, it it, it, uh, it, it was a definitely a team effort. But let's talk a little bit more about the first goal. So we have this cross, if I'm not mistaken, yep. coming from Goodmanson. Uh, I think it was Aaron Martin. Sorry. The cross that comes from Aaron Martin, which, by the way, even in our chat at the beginning, I was not too fond of what his performance was up until that. And then I'm talking about like early minutes. But right after that, almost as if he heard me, he turned out to be such a detrimental player for the entirety of the match itself that was 
a total turnaround, in my opinion. Detrimental anyway. to Peruden is. He, he was fantastic for us. Yeah, really. He had a great performance, I think. Another another person he could single out. So he did this great cross, got touched by the defender, which deflected up in the air. And you saw Retegi essentially coming there, putting his shoulders against a goal. So I thought he was going to pass it back or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he just jumps up in the air and the, does this beautiful bicycle kick, just like a pure striker. Martin, now well, the uh, Pauline is a dangerous looking one. Retegi! That is what the Italian national side are hoping he's going to keep doing to the end of the season. A quality strike from Matteo Retegi. And I think Italy, the national team, finally found their striker, in my opinion. I mean, let's hope so. It's what this move was all about for Retegi. I think you have to imagine, you know, we... Lucas give... Camaca. Camaca, I, 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 I don't know, he's just not responding to the expectations once again. He has that quality there, we know, but he's even Spalletti said, I'm not going to put a striker that is not even playing 20 minutes per match. I think there's a lot of things. Scamacca is a wholly different story, obviously. But I mean, look, where I'm focusing on this is is you've got Rotegi in a place where he's getting involved. He's playing. He's a regular contributor to what's happening right now. And that's what you want. That's why he's here. This is why uh, this is incredible for him. But it's also important for Genoa because as a club, as you and I both know, we need to be able to better provide a position, a place for players to really be able to shine and to be able to go to whatever that next level might become. I think that's where we are and where we are as a team. A risk is you come into a side that's just promoted from Serie B and you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe it's ne too negative of a focus. Maybe there's whatever, whatever. But this is what we need. It's what he needs. And, you know, hopefully it's it's a great showcase as well for what we can do with a manager like Gerardino and, and, and the other players that are around him that are also making him better. So it's great. Things are definitely going for him. He just has to focus in order to get that uh, spot. But two minutes after this amazing goal, another Euro goal, as they called or whatnot, um, and we're, we're scoring these beautiful looking, look, if you look at the goals, they're just beautiful. Like not every single one, even the next one up. So two minutes after the goal by Retegi, uh, this is when the one I kind of got mixed up with the two. This one, with, this time around was Goodmanson that in the last few matches didn't do that well. I mean, he was still there as a support. This match, even though he didn't score, you can't say he did a bad match. I think he did an amazing match. Great contribution, amazing cross, perfectly to the head of Bani jumping up, and it went in beautifully to precision. Goodmanson against uh, Yezibue, trying to make that angle. Clipped in, free header, and Mattia Bani delivers Genoa's second goal. But it is Albert Goodmanson who once again is able to pull the strings for the Griffone. Yes, it was wonderful from, from Goodmanson. I think just the perfect ball. But from that distance, too, it's kind of interesting because he almost played it more like a fullback. It's more the type of thing we've seen from Sabelli or from, we talked about Aaron Martin earlier, from, from players coming on the wide side. That's really kind of where the ball was coming in. And it's always fun to see Bonnie on the score sheet. You know, it, it's something that he had for such a long time not had that moment but it was just it was a perfect ball bonnie was in the exact right position and at this point we're flying and it's it's not it's not case closed i mean like you mentioned before like I, again i i like vasquez as a player I, I don't mind you putting vasquez up there even though he was subbed off early into the second half but like when you think about the the game the game wasn't really curtains until after udinese get a second yellow for one of their players and they're down to 10 men and we're already up to nothing we still have other chances we're still putting pressure on you know bottle has this this amazing opportunity that doesn't quite go in and we have other moments there's kind of just a little bit of a not perfect link up but really close between Rotegi and Goodmanson in the second half when we have that numerical advantage so like there's we were still treating this match as a match even though it was pretty much done and dusted as soon as Udinese went down to 10. And that's that's the other thing that's exciting about this. It wasn't something, you know, yes, Udinese had a goal that was ruled out, which I think was probably the right decision for that to have happened. There was a little bit more of a stink than what I expected, especially on, on, in Italy, on this decision, correct. I think I mentioned to you a few pods back where the zone has this uh, special show after the match and where you can hear the recordings from the referees with VAR room. Yeah. And you could hear that once the ref called 
called all, that goal out because he did say it, it was a foul. Mm -hmm. You could see her immediately the VAR room saying, okay, let me check. Let me see this image. Let me see the other one. Yeah, I agree. He didn't even touch the ball. It's a clear foul. He totally tripped the player and it, 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 they even complimented the, 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 the referee. Referee, my opinion, an amazing match. He was the one that made that huge mistakes back in the day of Juventus Bologna and he was not refereeing for for five months or something like that and now he came back and he did an amazing match but uh, to, to yes that was 100 so w w I guess what I was I'm trying to say here is that goal was definitely 100% there's no doubt in it that was a foul as he tripped the player behind and it was De Vinta that actually touched the ball that went into the goal because of the trip from the back behind him but um, uh, at the same time the stink was up in Italy where I don't know why that turned out to say well no that was a legit goal there was this individual i can't remember what's his role who is he if he was a referee in the past or whatnot he actually said we have to stop uh <laughs> ridiculous but we have to stop making these fouls we're being ridiculed by the by the english premier league because they would have allowed this i'm like what what are you talking about buddy well yeah i don't know i mean like i, I think the the healthy conversation maybe and I, look i obviously i agree the goal shouldn't have counted but the reason i think why people are re reacting to it, if you actually watch it back you don't see a lot of goals that get scored like this and it doesn't look as obvious like i actually thought at first when they in real time when they disallowed the goal that there was some sort of offside that had happened. Remember, it was kind of like a weird, it was another ball that kind of came across and it was hard to tell really quickly what had gone on there. You look at the replay and no, the guy's not offside and he's coming in. He clearly goes into the back of Deventer. So like, there's no question about that. It's foul. But like, he's he's making a play on the ball, trying to get contact on the ball. I think like for the sake of player safety, especially with how he struck Deventer, if you let that stand, I mean... <laughs> You could totally have your Achilles bone out and with something like that. So it's it's something that it's we don't see that so often. Like that tip of that type of a goal, I can understand why people would react a certain way, but it's it's definitely a foul. The rule is quite clear on this one. There is no doubt on it. You touch the ball, it's not foul unless it's a dangerous play. You touch the player, then it's a foul. Anyways, what happened soon after this goal? I think it was at that point. There another great player. Junior Messias, where uh, it was great to see the same formation that started with Napoli. And uh, Junior Messia had, wherever you put him, he does an amazing performance. This is an amazing thing about this player. And I still think we've only seen a percentage of his potential, which is tremendously incredible to have such a player. Like, we're blessed to have a player such like that. So that was the instance that I was referring to where the second that you mentioned a little bit, the second yellow card to their player that led to the red card. So this was sometime during the beginning of the second half. So to be uh, correct right. here, it's been four minutes, I think. It's 49. Yeah, so it was like the fourth minute of the second half and yellow card, that second yellow card, rightfully so. No doubts on that one either. And uh, that was a red card. So one player down for Udinese. Sin after that, it was nothing left for Udinese. As you said before, Genoa just controlled the match, was just playing around and trying chances without even too much eagerness. Maybe some have complained about that, but at the same time, you don't want players to get hurt and at the same time we just did lots of chances even Goodmanson had a couple of his and Enretegi had one as well it was a very pleasant second half without goals but it was a very pleasant second half so match ends to nothing 33 points we are at an amazing point now in the table. I said before that we are at 33 points, which means that we're sitting clear. Not that I want to look downwards, but just to say we're sitting clear eight points to the team that is right after us, which is Miracle <laughs> Impoli with uh, Nicola. And if we look at Sassuolo being third last right now, it's sitting at 20 points. That means we're clear 13 points from the relegation. So it's not mathematical, but we can say that it's it, it's a done deal for this year 
Looking upwards, we have Monza, obviously, what uh, the one step above us, which three points above us. So they're confirming their great form compared to last year as well. No improvement, mind you, but still. And if we look at the spots in Europe, which is still not understanding how many spots. I, I have to look into this. I don't know if you had looked into it at all. Depending on the points, apparently we have surpassed, obviously, Germany and, and even England. But apparently they're even talking about up to nine. I think it's a little bit too high, but at least eight or nine uh, teams that go into Europa, any the, the, the cups anyways. Mm -hmm. So if that was the case, let's look a bit more conservative, thinking about the eighth spot, which is right now sitting at for, for Napoli, uh, which they have just uh, won. Okay, Lazio, and yeah. They are at 40 points with Lazio, yes, and uh, both at 40 points. So that means that we're still seven points clear to that position those positions i'm not aiming for europe obviously it would be an amazing thing let's do one step at a time gilardino's uh, motto is to keep the focus on the 42 points he raised he seems like he's raising a point every match started with 40 and then 41 now it seems to be 42 but that gives good motivation also to the players i think it's something quite important and uh, i think he's doing that very well it's exciting obviously like I, I think at the beginning of the season there were some kind of vanity things being thrown around for 10th position which i still think would be kind of nice to finish mid table in the first season back regardless you're right like we're 13 points clear of the relegation spot and we're 10 points clear of several other teams that are right there ahead of the relegation place so like we've got a pretty good cushion right now uh, i'll be honest with you I'm, i may or may not be a help is live subscriber again this weekend because on the other side of things with our enemies on the other side and those who shall not be named they're not quite as safe and if you remember i can't remember actually if this was something that happened in Serie b last season or if this is a newer thing so there's the playouts at the at the bottom end samp are only they're literally the spot ahead of the playouts right now and they're they're lower than pizan goal difference just two points away from being in a relegation zone to Serie C if they were to lose that playout game. And then there are a few points ahead of uh, automatic relegation, but they're not exactly free sailing for that either. I think you look at Spezia, who also fantastic that they're the last kind of automatically relegated team at this point there's a five point gap happening right there now Serie B just looking at this table it's amazing again that's partially why I'm kind of like yeah you know, it, it's the the top end and the middle end of the table definitely seems like there's maybe more difference this season than last season but there's there's not that much difference on the other side for Samp in terms of getting into the playoff places. But still, how sweet would it be? Ferro Pisalo recently promoted into Serie B. I can't remember if it's the first time, but it surely hasn't been very many seasons for them where they're in Serie B if it's not. If they were to get a win against Samp, move Samp down into that category while we're sitting pretty in Serie A. Oh man, how sweet would that be? What, that's the dream. I'm, I don't want to say it too loud because that is a dream. That's where they deserve, in our opinion anyways, where they should be as they're just like, you know, they're still, I, I can't, I will never be tired in saying this. They are still riding on that fame from the 90s because since then, nothing. Yep. So enough yep. with this, you know, I mean, they would say, well, what about you guys? It's true. It's true. Well, we have uh, nine instead of one so i don't exactly. care if they were all one before the first world war it doesn't matter it doesn't they matter still, it still, still has it still had to start somewhere that means that if that was the case then a whole bunch of other uh teams up there it will be docked with a lot of uh Scudetti as well so it doesn't matter it had to start at some point and that shows also history of where it all started from as well that's right that's right uh, going back to what you were saying just quickly briefly about the city b uh, i i don't want to jinx it but yes you are right they are at three points no five points to third last or or playouts as you said like the three points but also five points up to the playoffs that was the beauty about the city b it's very compact one win brings you up one loss lose losing one match brings you down um but yeah um let's just keep fingers crossed and that would be something else going back to our city yeah i have to say that uh, the next match is not going to be that easy. There are some talks also about Calcio Mercato happening where apparently, I'm not saying this is official because we don't know yet, but apparently seems like Ekuban might not renew his contract. Uh, yeah. So that means that the, at the end of the season, he will be a free agent. Uh, there were a lot of teams in Serie B that were looking for him. While we are trying to step up and go to a different level, maybe it's a good thing, but it, he will definitely be dearly missed because you know you knew that anytime he would 
go onto the pitch still today and he's still preferred over all the new players in the attack or or he's like second uh, after Retegi. But at the same time, what I'm trying to say with that is uh, he, you knew that when he comes into the pitch, he will give all in all, whether it was a crappy day, whether his ball, the, the, all the balls were going like in the different, not in the goal, essentially, right? He was always missing. <laughs> That's a very nice way of saying it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the goal, in any other direction. But hold on, though. Can I be honest with you? When I read this news, were you not like a little bit pissed off? I, I know what you're where, where, what you're saying with that. It's like, why are you not reading? Well, first of all, you have to think about what. Where does Genoa want to go? Are they going to keep on signing someone that is now 30 years old, towards the end of his career as a striker, and a very high wage? So I don't want to say things that might not be true. What, whether he does not want to um, decrease his wage, or he has given all in all to Genoa and saying okay I just want to retire I don't know back in his to his homeland or something like that of course I'm more I'm no I've I was never angry when I read that news I was more saddened by that I think it was I, again it's uh, not official right it's not nothing's official we don't know what's going on we're all speculating we're it's part of the thing of being a fan is like a lot of these things don't get confirmed until they really are confirmed. Um, I don't have ill will against Ecubon. Let me just make that clear. But I, it's one of those things that's interesting because when you read that, you know, yes, it very well may be that we've already told him that we're not going to be honoring his wage demands or something like that. But you have to think as well, if there was something where, you know, there is a desire to stay at the club or, you know, we can't figure out the financials, but I want to be part of this. Like, I think you maybe handle it a little differently than just being like, we're done. If that's actually what's coming out from his camp. And it's kind of like the opposite. Like, I, I would think that if you're a player in his age bracket, at his pay bracket, that's saying, I'm going to go test the market is like, a, that's a risk at where he's at. So like, if he's ever at a place where he could even get the same, assuming he could just get a similar salary to what he's been offered today. I mean, to your point, maybe we're not willing to do that because of his age and we're moving on. I, I think for this, we are much more in a strong position than he is in this situation, which is why I was surprised to see it. Because like, if, if Ekuban leaves us today that sucks we lose attacking depth i don't agree with you i do not think he's starting in a single match the rest of the season he might start one or two we're gonna see goodmanson we're gonna see macias we're gonna see rategi you may see acuban if we need oh, I, I didn't mean that he was gonna start next year i'm just saying that right no i mean now, I, just oh. even this season like he's a substitute player for us and yeah. like he's he's valuable he's the first choice though he's a first choice substitute so he's not the first choice so like no, it, he's first choice substitute. No, 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 I know, I know. You know what I mean? Like I, I would think that there would be more desire to stay. I, again, you've got to be careful with these things. I think sometimes there can be too many like decisions, and we don't know what's going on with these players. That's so for, it, for true. That's really what it comes down to. There's no reason that anyone should be actually like as much as I was kind of like, what the hell? You can't be actually angry at the player. The player's a player. The player's got to look out for himself. But it, it just is surprising to me because it feels like I think that Genoa probably could give him for his future i think it could, it could maybe work out better so who we'll knows see. i I, cool. I would obviously if this is the end you wish the player the best in the future you wish him to go on if it's just this season i think some genoa fans are far too harsh in their assessment of him because he really has been an important player for us over the past couple seasons but it's it, for me it was surprising because it kind of is one of those things like when you're a player like a goodmanson or rotegi you have bargaining power because of your importance in the squad when you're number 12 coming off the bench it's not exactly the same but you know sometimes you do see that with strikers they're frustrated that they're not playing every single match and starting and so that's why they want to go somewhere else and to be fair you gotta admire competitiveness if that's the case and teach their own but that's right yeah that's an interesting one we'll see what ends up happening with this one all right more conversations will definitely happen we don't know anything yet about the stadium and more uh waters are being moved with respect to the training grounds and or also for our youth Youth sector, which is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh, by yeah. the way, the the Crisito is a training the under 14. They're leading their their category by almost 10 points. It's something incredible yeah. to see, love and it. I'm really happy to, to, to hear about that as well. I love that. Anyway, charge too. That's amazing. Primavera is doing very well as well. Um, so we'll talk more about it uh, in the next episodes. But I guess let's go to our break, and we have a special guest for our next match against Inter coming right up. 
And now, a short commercial break. My name is Fabrizio Cardone, and I approve this message. Welcome back. Bentornati at La Antenna Podcast Part 2. So this is the part where you all know that we're in our salotto or pub or whatever you want to call it with our guest. So it's a super special guest that I was actually invited to a pod a while back. I'll let him more talk about it, but welcome to our pod, Alex. Thank you so much for having me, Fabrizio. It's so nice to see you again, Matt. It's so nice to see you. And and yeah, so we, we're currently uh, on, on hiatus from the Cultural Connection pod, and it's because my schedule and Jerry's schedules have been so crazy, mostly mine. But at some point, we're going to start it up again. And uh, and Fabrizio, you were a great guest of ours. I don't know how long ago it was. It might have been a couple of years ago. But uh, yeah, it, it's great that we stayed in touch, and I'm happy to be here. Definitely was more than two, I mean, two, at least two years ago, that was when we were still in Syria. And uh, just for the record, uh, the other partner of yours is Jerry, Jerry Mancini. We still haven't had him. Planning to actually reach out to him for our upcoming soon anyways match against Lazio because he's a Lazio fan. And while Alex, as you can very well understand, he is a super Interista. <laughs> So tell us more about yourself. So you talked about your 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 connection pod. Uh, tell us a little bit more Inter, why Inter, and and all what you've done you've done and what you are uh, with respect to Inter. Yeah. So uh, my my father is uh, from Milano. He grew up there, and and he was uh, for his entire life. Still is. Uh, we watch matches together quite often. He's Interista, uh, even though so so his his father, my my late nonno, was uh, was an Inter supporter. But my uncle, my father's brother, is. A Milan supporter, so they they had the house divided. Uh, but you know, when my father, you know, he moved over uh, to the states uh, before I was born. I'm I'm born and raised here in Miami. But he always like I remember he had like the crazy satellite dish where he could watch some Serie A games, and he had like the the Rai International, and so he was watching matches. So you know, from from the time I think I was around eight years old when I started to get into Inter, and when I started to also get into the Italian national team, it was around uh, 1990. Too, when I started to, to get into Calcio and then you know, I have very fond memories, even though the Azzurri came up short, very fond memories from the 1994 World Cup. And, yeah. you know, then, uh, you know, a few years later, seeing uh, Ronaldo, the, you know, the original Ronaldo at Inter and all those exciting seasons. And I was a big uh, Bobo Vieri fan and just a lot of uh, even the teams that would fall short of, of Scudetto's was was a lot of fun watching the club and just watching all of the international flavor, the Brazilian and the Argentinians like Zanetti who came through the club. It was always enjoyable for me to cheer for Inter. And then, you know, several several years ago, it became a lot more accessible to watch City A in the States, like, you know, uh, be in sports for a long time. Yeah. And then uh, ESPN Plus and Paramount Plus right now. So it, it's nice to know that I, I never have to miss a match. It's definitely luxury right now compared yeah. to before, right? But going back to what you were saying, um, I remember, so you talked referring to Ronaldo, the original uh, in Italian, we call it uh, Ronaldo il fenomeno. Fenomeno, yeah. And uh, that was actually one of the matches I ever, uh, the only one I have ever been to San Siro. So that was at that time when Ronaldo was playing and the immensity of that stadium compared to, I mean, the, the Ferraris is considered to be, if not the best, one of the, definitely one of the best in Italy or yeah. even in general, you know, English style, whatever you want to call it. But San Siro, it's a bigger version, in my opinion, uh, even though you guys guys are still calling it Curva. It's similar uh, in a way as a structure to, to, to Genova, but just a little bit more curved without the, the divisions of the of the sides and so on. But the immensity of that stadium. So actually, I'm, I hear them talking out by myself here, of course, but what I want to say is like, so is Milano Interista or is Milano Milanista? You know, honestly, I, I have, and I've had Milanisti tell me the same thing, that they feel like there are probably slightly more, it's very split. Like it's not, yeah. I don't think it's clear one way or the other, but I've even had some Milanisti tell me they feel like there's more Interisti in the city 
Whereas I, I think Milan, especially with, with all the Champions League success that they had over the years, uh, I feel yeah. like Milan may be slightly more international. And, and I can say this when I go into, um, you know, there there are a lot of like uh, soccer stores, you know, in, in Florida. And, and obviously yeah. in, in Florida, you know, very uh, big Hispanic population. La Liga is very popular here, but EPL is popular everywhere in the States. Serie A, not as much. But even when, when I go into like soccer stores in the States, I, I see you know a lot more a lot more milan jerseys maybe now with pulisic being being in milan that that probably helps as well but over the years i see maybe more milan shirts and and some juve shirts and then occasional inter shirts i get excited like when i see an inter shirt i'm like oh great they're finally representing and hey champions league finals last year maybe more people are catching on but i i feel like maybe milan a little bit more internationally but maybe inter uh, a little bit more within within italy and within the city well thanks for making us feel like little minnows because if you're excited if you find an inter jersey you can only imagine us not even finding ours I, I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and if I ever see, if I see Genoa gear in the stores, I'll look for it. I'll, I'll take pictures and send to you. And to well, see Genoa gear in the stores, we've definitely made it. I yeah. was in Milan looking for Genoa gear and they're like, go to Genova. <laughs> 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 they literally said that to my face. I was like, all right, fair enough. Wow. Uh, well, yeah, to your point, Alex, internationally speaking, obviously uh, Milan is the darling of Italy with respect to the time of, of, uh, of Berlusconi's era and so on. Obviously, they'll always rub it. I can see they, them rubbing it to you have that, you know, the numbers are, are there, right? I still don't get that Juve thing. I still never will get it and never understand it. I don't but... get it either. <laughs> We can say it here, I suppose, right? The safe but, space, yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, from an inter perspective, at least you now you can rub it into them by saying we are the first ones to have the two stars. Because I have a funny feeling that that's going to happen. I know <laughs> you're superstitious, but I mean, ultimately, uh, we kind of briefly touched upon it before we went uh, recording, but... It's all on your hands. Yeah, it, it's been uh, really uh, an incredible run of form, especially since the calendar turned over to 2024. Inter have not lost in, in any competition since that happened. And they also, you know, really, I, and I, I always say this because we, we see it over the years, if you're going to win a Scudetto, and of course, it's the work is not completely finished for Inter. It's trending in that direction. But not only do you need to take care of your business, you do require a little bit of luck, okay? And up until, up until a few weeks ago, Juventus was still looking like a contender. It was actually, you know, the head-to-head -head victory that Inter had against Juve at, at the at the Meazzo was really kind of what started the separation. And, and Juve have, you know, been a little bit in a tailspin since that point. You know, I, I really, I expected, I expected Milan to be a contender uh, this season. Like, I, I thought it would, they would be really right there with Inter, uh, potentially for the title. And, you know, we were talking off-air, Fab, about Napoli. I, I don't know. I, I, I thought Napoli would be in the mix. That could not be farther from the case right now uh and and yeah inter have not only taken care of their own business in in winning games and honestly doing it in a, a pleasing aesthetic way that i'm not really accustomed to you know going back a couple of years conte's inter was not you know not always the most beautiful football but it was very effective you know, it was the same thing with uh, with Mourinho's inter you know you would get amazing moments and trophies and results but you weren't always playing champagne football to do it where uh, under inzaghi it's it's been the total package they've they've been scoring goals for fun and uh you know the, the matches have been incredibly entertaining like I, I was i was talking to you off air beforehand that my my, my son who's my my little interista who actually just turned six years old today he's so spoiled watching this version of inter that when we're watching matches if, if like the first two minutes go by and they haven't scored a goal yet he'll be they're playing terrible why haven't they scored yet he's very impatient and if they if they win a match one nil he's like Why didn't they score more goals? <laughs> like so, sometimes that's just the way it is. So, in, a small interista, ha, ha, have you brought him to Milano yet to, to watch a match? Not yet. He's so excited for that. I keep talking to him. I, I think we're we're trying to uh, to plan a trip. For, for next winter, because a, a lot of times uh, uh, over the years, even before he was around, when my family would travel to Italy, a lot of times we would go in the summer when it's the city uh, off season. I've, I've only had the pleasure of attending one match about uh, three, four years ago uh, against uh, against Samp, actually. So ha happy that Inter won that game, of course, for you for you guys as well. So he, he's he's not been he's not been overseas yet, but we're we're planning probably next winter to go, and we're going to take it at least. I'm going to try to make it so we can see two matches. 
matches, but we'll we'll yeah. attend at least one. That's excellent. And I'm sure awesome. he's not only super excited, but beyond that, I would suppose. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it would it will be his his first time uh, in Italy, so hopefully he can enjoy the amazing food. He loves pizza, so he'll uh, he'll <laughs> he'll be he'll be having that all over all over the country. And you know, hopefully uh, hopefully whatever what you know not not to get too ahead. I don't know what Inter's going to look like next season, but hopefully next season they're putting a, a pleasing product on the field for him as well. I was just going to ask because you know we kind of talked about it for a second and Alex mentioned it I hadn't really even thought about it because it's been so long into the season but obviously the storyline coming into this season was oh look at Milan look at all these things that they're doing oh my gosh this is going to be their season again and uh, we were kind of not really thinking about U of A for different reasons Obviously, they've had benefit of not having as much competition uh, to deal with. And so you saw them maybe look stronger than perhaps they have been or whatever it might be. But like, just curious to get your take why this seems to be the magic potion so far for for Inter this season. Like what's really worked? What's clicked? Well, I, I think that it... Oftentimes, I think it maybe takes multiple seasons to truly adapt to a manager. Uh, yeah. I think Simone Inzaghi is is in his bag in a way that he wasn't the last couple of seasons. And I think Marcus Turam has been a huge mm-hmm. part of that. I, I look at him as not only the transfer of the season for Inter, but maybe the transfer of the season for Serie A uh, in general, because he has just been everything that Lukaku was good at, Turam is also good at, and then everything Lukaku wasn't so good at with the things like you know the touch and the finishing and the grace Turam has been good with that stuff as well because I, I think it's just it's so important and, and obviously Lautaro has been playing just out of yeah. his mind this season 22 goals at this point uh, he's running away with Capo Cananiere but he I, I don't think that you could unlock this Lautaro without having the perfect strike partner for him and it's like you know during Lukaku's first stint you know because he he left and, and came back last season during his first stint he and Lautaro had a, a really a really good link up for most of the way but it was mostly Lukaku was the one usually scoring the goals and Lautaro was the one facilitating I think with this partnership it's been Turam has been facilitating uh, and and he's really bringing out the best in Lautaro as a striker Lautaro has also matured and I, I just think with with, with Inzaghi's tactics um, you know having finding the right mixes at the wing backs you know the, it's been a little bit more inconsistent at the right wing back because you know various injuries uh, but on, on the left side with Di Marco it's it's been so consistent for the past couple of seasons and the way he's able to overlap uh, overlap with the attack and get involved. So you know the wingbacks have been critical for Inzaghi and there's been a lot of success there. I think what is two things that have surprised me most about this season, maybe it is one thing because they're linked together. I didn't expect the the three-man back line to be this good. Um, you know, especially when you've had, you know, players like Acherbi and De Vrij who are who are aging. And at times over the last couple of years, you kind of thought, hey, these guys are maybe finished or, or on you know, on the back nine, uh, they, they've been spectacular. Havard has been, you know, a wonderful addition. You know, he did miss some time with injury, but he's been very good this year. And then, you know, Bastoni, who's the one that I, I did have faith in being, you know, the the younger, more steady player. But I, I, I'm really surprised with the way the back line has come together. I was not expecting that. Um, and then, you know, in net, I think this really ties into the back line. But, you know, Jan Zomer has been, uh, he's been so successful with all the clean sheets this year. But I have to give the back line most most of the credit because there have been some big matches where he's not faced a shot on target. I mean, the, the win that I referenced earlier against Juventus, not a single shot on target. The one uh, nil victory against uh, Atletico Madrid a couple of weeks ago, that was, uh, he didn't face a single shot on target. So uh, his best friend has been the defense in front of him. And I, I think that's what has surprised me most. The midfield, I'm a little bit less surprised with because uh, Chalhanolu has, has really worked well uh, in Inzaghi's system. Uh, the, you know, they haven't skipped a beat without Rose which is you know th- thankful because he was he was their most consistent midfielder in previous years but uh, they've done really well without him and then I think some of the continuity uh, Mikatarian has been really good but Ella has had some ups and downs but when he's on he's on and I, I was pretty surprised with this past match day because uh, Chalhanolu he's pro- we're probably not going to see him in the in the Genoa match he's got a muscular issue um, I, I thought Christian Aslani played really well this past weekend I hope he can do that consistently because he's only 
21 years old and he's you know he's had a hard time kind of breaking into Inzaghi's rotation I imagine he'll probably start uh, these next two games uh, against Atalanta and against Genoa so I have to wonder if I, if Aslani can be consistent because he he could potentially be a weak link in the midfield but he did play pretty well this past weekend so do you foresee that Turam, Macerbi, Quadrado any of these are going to be on the match or they're out as well I think I think they're all going to be out a Cherby I'm not as sure about but I think I think Turam is going to be out so it's going to be probably Ale- Alexis and Lotaro starting uh again and then uh and then Arnatovic who is uh he's been interesting this year he's if I had a dollar for every sitter that he's missed this year I would just have a big bucket full of dollars like he you know but he, he's also scored you know a couple of meaningful goals within the last couple of weeks so I give him some credit so yeah I, I think I think Turam will still be out uh Chahanolu definitely still out and, and we'll see about a Cherby. So looking at the run of form in the last 14 matches, the only tie was against Genoa. Then everything right. else, including yeah. all the competitions, are all wins. I'm going all the way back, not including, of course, the tie against Real Sociedad. But after that one, the only points lost or non-win was against Genoa. So I guess we're getting closer to, to, to the clue, the most important part, to talk about the next upcoming match. What What's your point and your take? So we talked about what Inter has done so far. We're hoping, thinking, fingers crossed. Actually, let me just add a small parenthesis there based on the experience that we had both playing against uh, Milan and Inter. Interisti have, so far, anyways, a little bit more maturity when it comes to what is fair and what is not fair versus Milan seems a little <laughs> less. <laughs> At least this is my perspective. Sure. <laughs> Give me for saying that. But what, what was I going to say with that? What's the biggest fears that you have against Genoa? What looks comfortable? And also from your perspective, from an Inter's perspective, what's your weakest spot and what's your strength yeah you know I'm, I'm glad you you brought up that, that Genoa was the last time Inter dropped points and and so, sometimes sometimes they can be a tricky matchup and, and a bit of a bogey matchup historically and then I also just with the congested run of fixtures I, I think there there's always potential yeah. for heavy squad rotation that's one thing you could look for which could give Genoa an opportunity and just general fatigue so so Inter uh, midweek they have uh, the makeup match against Atalanta which is you know and, and honestly I I could see a number of different responses depending on how that match goes. Like if, if Inter drop points in that match, maybe they feel a little bit more pressure to play a full squad against Genoa to try and you know, essentially take a step farther into securing a Scudetto because, you know, you get a little uncomfortable maybe if you drop points in that Atalanta match. But then, you know, mid- midweek uh, after after the Genoa match, you have uh, another leg against Atletico Madrid coming up. So it's it's a, congected fi- it's a congested fixture list for Inter. So uh, that can always be a concern. And maybe you take your eye off the ball a little bit for a game like that. Uh, and then, you know, I, I guess my, my other uh, concern for these next, at least these next two match days are is... Uh, are they going to get consistency from the attack, right? Because again, we mentioned Turam is is unlikely to play. I think there's a chance he can maybe return uh, for the next leg against Atletico, but I don't expect to see him in these next two Serie A fixtures. So th- that's been a spot of, of inconsistency. Uh, Stryker has been outside of Lautaro and Turam. It's been a little bit of a problem point. I mean, uh, Alexis has been very inconsistent. Uh, you know, Arnautovic has been just so so bad at times that it's like it, it's like you know having having ten men on the pitch sometimes so he's he's got to find more consistency so you know if you take some of that partnership and some of that service away from Lautaro that could make things a little bit tougher and I know from Inter's point of view they they would love to you know to be able to build leads and matches so they can sub Lautaro off to keep him fresh maybe they won't have the luxury to do that so that that's definitely a concern and I, I really think that that that's my number one concern because um you know when, when it comes to the midfield and the wing backs. They've been able to establish continuity even with different pieces, you know, when whether it's been Dumfries or Bisek or Darmian playing at the right wing back, they've been pretty consistent on that side. And they, they've shown some consistency in the midfield. Uh, you know, I, I did mention that Aslani is someone who could potentially be a liability if he's still playing in that match, even though he did play well. Uh, this past game. So, you know, I, I'd say probably, though, 
partner for Lautaro would be my biggest concern. What about on the Genoa side? Oh, I, again, I, I think this is a team that sometimes gives into problems. So I think on the Genoa side, there is always a chance that they could sting Inter. I mean, if, if Genoa were to score first or if they get a late equalizer, I could see some concerns there as well. Even at the Mazza? Uh, I don't know. It, it is, you mentioned earlier what, what an amazing building it is. And it, it gets me thinking because, uh, you know, I, I, I primarily uh, cover American football in, in Miami where they're, they're known for not having the best, you know, turnouts and live attendance in games. You go to the Meazza, it's the complete opposite. It's, it's always completely full and sold out. So I, I think being at home could be a saving grace. It's definitely one of, it's probably the biggest Um, just in terms of the sheer number of people that they fit into that building, I think it's the largest in Italy. It's it's a big advantage when it comes to having the 12th man. News, actually, just we're recording on Tuesday, as you said, just uh, Alex just said a uh, sec few seconds ago. Right now, we have about 3,000 Genoani going to Milano. The capacity for, for guest tickets is around 4,000, if I'm not mistaken, or 4,200. Anyways, around that uh, uh, number. So it, it could be likely uh, to be closer to that number. Uh, it's still early because we're going to be playing on Monday. That's right. We still have to be playing against, as you said, uh, Atalanta, but there's still a lot of time. And wrapping back to what I was saying also with respect to the Milanisti versus the Interisti, while we have always issues with the Milanisti with respect to fans, so restrictions based on, you know, fighting, not fighting and so on, the chief of police has said that there is no restrictions in place for Liguri coming into Milano. Great. So that's uh, that's a nice sign, in my opinion, also, again, talking that using that word maturity with respect to perhaps both sides. Let's keep fingers crossed. No, and it's good to hear that uh, from your perspective, because I know, uh, you know, sometimes the uh, the Curva Nord are not all, are not always the best behaved, <laughs> as we know, and they and they can get themselves in the headlines sometimes for not the best reasons. But I know that, you know, obviously the heart of, I think the heart of most Interisti, most of the fan base is in the right place. And it's actually, we had a, uh, I, I briefly mentioned to you before uh, recording that we had a guest from Napoli, uh, Rafa, Raffaello. We were talking about this long, very long longevity uh, friendship, uh, twinship or gemellaggio with Napoli that uh, died in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. And it, we couldn't, or I couldn't remember specifically the reason why I looked it up a little bit and essentially what happened was there was some exchanges of fights of Inter fans versus someone I can't now I can't remember that team and the Genoa fans were showing you know contribution to the loss of that fan and that made all the Napoletani go all berserk <laughs> that's oh. how friendship died so mm-hmm. I guess it shows to me I'll ask probably we have our chat personal our internal chat with among Genuani and he's a, a, a part of the old trust. His name is uh, Will William. And maybe I'll ask him how close or not are we with uh, with the Interisti, but I don't see, at least from the outside, not being part of Ultras, any, you know, bad blood between us. So that's, again, another good thing, even whatever the turnout of that match may be. I keep cracking up that we have a shared fandom, perhaps maybe not to the same degree as some players. You think about Panda, obviously, Milito. Yeah. A number of players have worn both of our colors. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yes. and a number of those players yeah. have scored against Inter wearing uh, wearing Genoa colors, which is always a concern. Yes, Palacio, I think, goes back into that category. So yeah, there, there's I several, that. several uh, guys that... Yeah. Our brothers in Pandav is what I was, that's correct. That's right. Uh, so I guess let's jump into uh, the predictions. I can give a quick breakdown, I guess, on my yeah. side. I think, sure. um, you know, you, you guys talked about it pretty well. The match week is a weird one. Less, less tricky to navigate from a Genoa perspective, obviously, because we've got actually a lot more rest in between our last match and this current one. For Inter having a match tomorrow, um, we're recording again on Tuesday, so by the time this airs on Friday, you have one match midweek, then you have ne- another match to prepare for, and there's already like a lot of, of uh, folks out of the squad already. So you would expect rotation to happen even without that going in there. I think this one will be what I'm kind of interested to see a little bit more of. I know Fabri, you and I have talked about this like the last couple weeks, but we've seen kind of this emergence for us, at least within our season of, I think, Junior Macias and his positioning, how he's come in these last few weeks being kind of playing more in a 
pure midfield role, having him on the field at the same time with Goodmanson, with Rotegi. We've always had this thing this year where we've not quite had, it seems like everybody really clicking in the right way on an attacking level. Like there was a couple of weeks where we didn't have Rotegi. Goodmanson had a some slower matches in the last kind of more recent weeks to some degree and then the CS hadn't really taken off yet I think we're starting to see a little bit of that combination all coming together with some of the more fortifying presence that we have with the Badels and the friend groups and those other type of guys that are in there so how that looks I think like it might sound sort of cliche to say this but I think we're gonna look a little different than when we played into in the earlier parts of the season uh, obviously we're gonna be missing our our, our goal scorer in that particular match, which is Dragos in who no longer is with the club. But it's it's a curious one, I think, to how we how we respond to this. And it's a little bit obviously of a challenge, as Alex had said. We're going to the Miyasa. This is I think is this the first time Rotegi's played a league game there? So you kind of wonder the guys get up a little bit that I think there's a little bit of this thing with especially the Goodmansons and the Rotegis of our squad where you kind of think that they live for moments like this type of a thing. You get all those things out of the way and all those feel-good moments that are there, I think you still are really nervous about this match if you're a Genoa fan. Regardless of where we are on the table right now or anything else, it's, it's one you can't really look at it and feel too optimistic towards. I think even without Kuram, it's hard to imagine Inter not having a bit more of an advantage. I mean, Lotaro has just been on such an unbelievable tear. Um, I would prop my uh, fairly conservative prediction. I think it'll probably be two one to Inter, and I, I do think that this is this feels like another one on, on the back of his wonderful goal uh, against Udinese. I think maybe we see Rotegi on the score sheet for us again, but I think it'll be a good performance from the Inter boys, uh, despite maybe being short-handed, but still one that, as, as Genoani will will look at and not be ashamed, uh, unlike a few seasons ago where we just totally got spanked. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very very much in line with you. I, I was thinking um, I was thinking two one. Uh, obviously, being at the Meazza is is a, a nice advantage that Inter enjoy for this match. Um, yeah, I, I think it, either two one or three one because may, maybe they'll get like a late goal if uh, if Genoa is really pressing to try to try and tie the match since Inter are so good on the counter. I, I think maybe with the the scoring, you know, I wouldn't be too shocked if Lautaro does get on the score sheet and then maybe Fratesi, who always seems to, when he comes on as a midfield sub, always seems to find the goal. He's got a nose for that. So I could see those being the goal scorers. And I was thinking Rategi as well is who I could see getting on the score sheet for Genoa. And I could even see this one being the type of match where uh, Genoa either score first or it's 1-1 for a long time and it, it inter don't really find the breakthrough until late in the match i could see it being I, i've been spoiled in recent weeks with a lot of comfortable results i could see this being maybe a less comfortable result i'm gonna go a little bit different compared to you guys i was looking at the amount of matches that you've done compared to us uh 11 since we met anyways 11 versus 8 for us and that 11th is going to be played tomorrow based on when we are recording. And and it's still going to be, in my opinion, still an important one, especially from an Atalanta perspective, because they are trying to catch that fourth spot. So it'll be very important for them to do a result, even though I want to say Gasperini step aside because it's okay if Inta does some good results so we can come and do ours. <laughs> but that's a different story. That'll be all, all up to Atalanta. But at the same time, I think to... I'm, I'm trying to think here. Obviously, it can go all, all the way around. It could, we could see Inter's fatigue a, a little bit relaxing because they have a good cushion. Also depends on what Juve might be doing. I can't remember now. They will be playing first so that they as a Juventus. So that can also put some relief of pressure on on as well and uh, at the same time as i said before i didn't i mentioned it purposely to say i mean i'm not, I'm not trying to toot our own horn but in the last several amount of matches we were the only ones that were able to stop you now that oh. wasn't the ferrari so that's a totally different story right. but perhaps based on the fatigue the amount of uh, turnover so not only your typical starting 11 four days after uh, the, the atlanta match it's us after us it's going to be five matches five days sorry 
only five days to prepare for the Bologna. After Bologna, it's going to be, again, Champions Round uh, against Atletico, which we know it's not going to be an easy one. So maybe there is a little bit less focus or less worrisome to have to make points. However, I do have to say that the last three matches, Inter has done four goals each match. So you saying that they're not doing that well in, 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 in the attack still makes me a little shivers. <laughs> you know, it's a little bit... You know, I'm a little afraid. But Gilardino has shown great potential to be that great coach that he has shown to be so far. And if he he studies them, he even says that he doesn't sleep, especially closer to the matches, because he wants that perfect match. And I believe he is capable of doing it. He studies that he looks at the videos, he talks with the he 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 goes into the souls of the players themselves. Obviously, going to the mats is not going to be easy. In the first leg, we face a lot of big teams at home and that's where we made our decent results whether they were wins example against Roma or ties example against you guys or Juventus I'm not talking about the Milan one because that was a full robbery but that's a different one <laughs> but uh, I actually see a 0-0 zero, zero. okay at least that defensive performance then and, and, and still a point a point for each side if so <laughs> exactly a point exactly Perhaps yeah. My heart is obviously speaking a little bit louder than my than my brain, but uh, at the same time, it's it's not impossible based on the factors that I mentioned before. In my view, last two matches have ended in draws, so it's not exactly completely out of the question that that would be the result too. So. To Alex's point, we have a track of record which is a little bit the head to head is not necessarily a good <laughs> head to head for right. <laughs> but yeah. Anyways, so Alex, thank you first of all. We're, I guess we're at a wrap. Thank you first of all for joining us on at our pod. It was wonderful to have you and and to hear about your excitement for Inter and and we want to hear more about your little one going to Milan and, and his experience to, at the at the San Siro and see 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 what that comes out as. Yeah, that's so, going to be a huge event. And if, if whatever match we go to, if they don't win, he he's going to pitch a fit. So hopefully. Hopefully Inter are successful. Pick an easy one. Pick an easy one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if anyone wants to reach out to you, how to, where and how can they do it? Great. Yeah, you can definitely find me on uh, the app formerly known as Twitter, now X at uh, Alex Donno, spelled D-O-N-N-O. You could find me there. And, you know, for anyone who is uh, interested in, uh, in in North American sports, uh, you know, I host a, a daily college football podcast, uh, Locked on Canes. You can find me there as well. That's perfect. Uh, great chat and looking forward to the match this uh, coming Monday. Should be a fun one. Me too. And I forgot until you said it earlier, I forgot it was a Monday. So I, I'm going to have to clear out some of my, my Monday schedule <laughs> next <laughs> week to make sure I can watch. <laughs> Got to get this calendar blocks on now. Yeah, yeah. But we, we all have to do it. <laughs> all right. So thank you once again, Alex. And uh, for everybody listening, obviously, you can reach us always on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Drop us any line, uh, comments or DMs. But never forget, always and forever. Forza Genoa. You've listened to La Lanterna, a spotlight on Italian football, a podcast powered by Genoani Siresta. Thank you for listening and see you next week. 